This is the technical overview of the uh, Z Wallet. Let's get started with the overall architecture of the application. So we have a standard three-tier app where there's separation between the UI and the calculation engine where we will have the business logic and the, uh, the data model. And we have uh, the third tier is the storage of the data. The UI is in Flutter, which gives us a unified code base for both Android and iOS. And the engine is in Rust because we need a high performance and we also can leverage this portability. And finally, the data is stored in uh, SQLite. With SQLite, we benefit from the database uh, ACID properties. So we have Atomicity. Um, well, the rest I don't truly really remember. Um, concurrency, isolation, and durability. That's the fourth thing. And this database is accessible from both uh, the outside, from, from the UI, and from Rust. The communication between uh, the uh, the first tier, the UI, so from the UI to the uh, uh, to the engine, uh, is gone through um, dot FFI dot uh, dot uh, foreign function interface, which is a binding to C. So we have to create the C bindings uh, for Rust with the uh, bindgen uh, tool. And uh, we can then also generate FFI binding with uh, the dark code generator, FFI gen. Then it's a, it's a pretty simple manner of calling Rust functions uh, directly from Dart or from Flutter. Doing so gives us type safety because all the code is generated uh, directly from uh, the interfaces in, uh, in Rust. And uh, in speed. The, uh, there's no conversion to there's no data conversion to uh, to the serialization model, uh, and also and this is very important uh, I think is that we don't have to write too much code to do this uh, this uh, this link. Most of the code is uh, code generated, and uh, communication backwards from the engine back to the UI. This is all done through SQLite. So the uh, the engine will write the uh, modifications to the um, data model into the, into the database, and the UI will query that uh, for SQL. The idea here is that uh, the UI is, is uh, read only, has only read read only access, and all the, the updates are done in the engine and the database transactions. So this allows us to have a fairly small number of application logs and it improves uh, uh, concurrency. So going on to the uh, Flutter layer, the Flutter application side is uh, fairly standard. It's a reactive uh, application, uh, UI application. So we have, uh, we store the, the state in uh, Mobex which is a, a state management library, uh, very similar to Redux. So the ability of using uh, reactive uh, observers let us have um, a very stream, streamlined uh, UI where we have a store, a store that uh, contains the data that we read from the database. And we have a set of observers um, that form the UI. So whenever the, um, uh, the store changes, uh, the UI will be automatically refreshed. And we can have a certain level of granularity and minimize the amount of refresh by um, choosing which uh, components, which widgets will observe which part of the data model. So this is not like we have to refresh every part of the UI whenever something changes. And one advantage of Flutter is that it has uh, a bunch of uh, third-party plugins which lets us uh, focus on the uh, on our application logic, uh, specific logic, rather than we do uh, the work um, specifically. I'm talking here about the ability to produce charts, uh, to have data tables, uh, which um, paging, pagination, uh, sorting, these kind of things, and a unified UI toolkit. So by default, you will have a material look and feel. 
Um, but this is also customizable, and, and you could have uh, you could switch to a, a more iOS style. Other thing that you will get there in a, in a, on a, in a third party library is uh, biometric authentication. And here also the library allows us to fall back into using a pin code or a passcode if the uh, the user does not have uh, a fingerprint reader or did not register uh, fingerprints. And there are other, other things, so I'm just going to go quickly over them. Um, there's an input for money data type, um, decimal type, which does not have the issue of rounding uh, of uh, floating point numbers. Uh, libraries around internationalization and localization, and obviously a QR code generator and a QR code scanner. So these are all the five major components of, of the wallet. All in all, uh, the Flutter side is uh, is about three three thousand lines of code, so roughly roughly three k. It probably would could be big big better now, uh, but just to say that it's not a very big code base. Moving on to the engine, the main part of the engine and where all the stuff is actually uh, revolves around is the uh, warp sync. Um, synchronization method. So I'm not going to give too much details about warp sync in this presentation to keep it still high level. Uh, but let's just say that warp sync is the, one of the main reasons why uh, this uh, wallet is different, the differentiates from the other wallets. Its synchronization speed is much higher. Um, the other role of the engine, of course, is to maintain the data model. So for the data model, we have uh, several aspects. Um, this data model is very similar to the one uh, from Libras Zcash. Um, so we have we have accounts, um, we track received notes, and they are, so received notes would be the um, output uh, descriptions, output notes that uh, are targeted towards one of the, uh, the accounts we own. And um, of course, we, we keep track of transactions. And the last two point elements here, the, the tree state uh, is for the anchors, and the sapling witnesses is also for uh, being able to generate the, um, the, Merkle, the Merkle path that is involved in the, the ZK star. And there are other small parts of the, uh, of the data model. That is, uh, all of this is, is stored in the database. So the uh, the engine is, is not very big. Um, it's actually around two thousand lines of code. Um, the test code is I think is actually bigger than the, the 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 code itself. Because here we leverage uh, libRC cache for uh, building the transaction, so for for producing the uh, the data required for sending. And we just have to uh, to implement warp sync. So that's for detecting nodes. Things like uh, node decryption is also coming from the Libra CD cache. So, so uh, what is warp sync? So by, by profiling the code uh, execution in the, um, the traditional traditional uh, library, uh, sorry, traditional wallet. Uh, we identify that the major uh, bottleneck is uh, around node uh, decryption, node trial decryption, and the um, the calculation of uh, the maintenance of the uh, sampling witnesses. So sampling witnesses uh, are required if you want to spend, uh, so you spend want to spend nodes. Uh, but unfortunately, you pay the cost of this maintenance even if you are not sending the nodes. Um, you still have to update the sampling witnesses for each receive, unspent received node whenever you receive a block. Uh, this cost accumulates. Of, you can trim it, you can prune the very old ones. Um, so for example, uh, you can trim everything that is older than 100 uh, blocks. Uh, but in advance, you do not, you can't know that you will be needing a particular Sapling witness because it depends on the user. The reference implementation um, works around two major classes. One is uh, keeping track of the 
uh, of the commitment trees. So this is uh, the commitment tree is where all the nodes, whether it's yours or it's other people uh, commitment, commitment uh, nodes, are, are stored. And your job is uh, to maintain uh, at least uh, the, the last element of uh, the frontier of that tree. So in order to be able to update that commitment tree when new blocks are coming. But you also need to, uh, to maintain uh, what is called uh, sampling witnesses. So what we, meant, uh, we, called, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, sampling witnesses. And the data structure for that is called uh, incremental witness. So these incremental witnesses are linked to uh, to a particular node that you are tracking. So there will be one incremental witness per receive node and one commitment tree in general. Whenever you have a new node commitment, so whether it's yours or it's an output from a, another transaction, so whether you are able to decode it or not, it doesn't matter. This node commitment, which is a hash, will have to be a handle, I have to be appended both to the commitment tree and to each incremental witness. So this is how the re reference implementation in the Rust cache works. And um, so what are the good things about this implementation? So simple, simple path. So you add one node at a time. And once the node is added, you never have to come back. So you can discard the data if you are Talking about synchronization, the end result here, the, the implication here is that you can process blocks uh, forward. And as soon as a block is processed, or even, uh, even you could do it at the node uh, level. If once a node commitment is processed, usually we do at the block level, you can discard all the block data. And the second very important thing is that this implementation is, is, uh, is a reference. So whatever the, the, uh, the result of this um, maintenance creates, we, we know that it's the right uh, value, the, is the right uh, result. Uh, however, there are so a few things that uh, we would like to improve because this is again the, the major bottleneck. And the result, the result Sorry, the reasons why uh, are summarized here. First, first of all, uh, it's a single thread operation. Uh, you receive a node, um, you, you, uh, you loop through nodes by looping through blocks and by looping through transactions inside the block. And for each transaction, you will do a trial decryption. And then after that, if you uh, if you get all the, the the node is yours, you will create a new incremental witness. If the node, in any case, you will get the node uh, commitment and update all the incremental witnesses that you had already, plus the commitment tree. Okay, so this is a process. So you first try to decrypt, uh, and then update your commitment tree and incremental witnesses. Um, so the, the data is, is separated. Uh, each class, uh, commitment tree and incremental witness, has its own representation of the uh, Merkle, Merkle tree path. And because of that, it's hard to parallelize. Because you, we, we hard, it's hard to know in advance which element of the tree, each uh, incremental witness and each co uh, commitment tree um, will, will need, will impact. And the third issue, which is probably the biggest one, is that because the uh, incremental witness and the commitment trees are two separate uh, data structures, the, the information that they encapsulate, the, which is mostly hashes, are recomputed between them. So, of course, they are not identical. It's not the same data structure, the same values between uh, all these, uh, these objects. But it's quite common that at least the root will be, for example, at least the root will be uncommon. So the root hash will be recalculated for, calculated for the commitment tree and also for each incremental witness. Um, and, if, and also, uh, for, unfortunately, these hashes are very slow, well, relatively slow. Um, not slow, of, of course, if you calculate a few hundreds, but if you're talking about a few million, 
Now, the, the cost adds up. The reason why it's raw is because these are not um, hashes, uh, SHA, crypto hash, uh, regular crypto hash with basically do bit manipulation. They are based on um, on the ECC uh, cryptography, so ECC, ECC math, and they involve uh, point uh, multiplication. So what we want to do to uh, reduce all that is is to spin the uh, to spin the the model around. So instead of having uh, the uh, the data the, the main piece of data being uh, the commitment tree and the incre incremental witness, we only have the major piece of data is now the Merkle tree. So the the Merkle tree will be calculated once and updated once, and then we will have uh, the uh, commitment tree and incremental witness be extractors or visitors of the data from that main Merkle tree. So the, from a very high level point of view, um, we do batch commitment. So we, instead of adding one node at a time, we can, for example, add um, 100,000 nodes on one go. So the Merkle tree would jump from, for example, having uh, 5,000 nodes to uh, 50,000 nodes. And as we update that uh, data structure, as we update the Merkle tree, so we're calculating the hashes layer by layer, we would have visitors um, for our commitment tree and incremental witness go and fetch the data pieces that they need. At the end of the day, the, the, the advantage of doing this this way is that the hash calculation is well organized. So we would go from layer to layer. So we can we, we can parallelize hash calculation layer by layer. So we start with, for example, the we start with the leaves, and then we go to level def one, def two, def three. And after the um, each layer is uh, calculated, we will have these uh, uh, commitment tree and incremental witness objects go and, and update their partial state. And eventually, once the, we reach the top, uh, the commitment tree and the all incremental witnesses are updated. So it's, it's a more interleaved approach to the calculation. And the other thing that uh, this approach allows us to do is to leverage some relationship between uh, the incremental witnesses and the commitment tree. So, for example, the cursors do not have to be calculated. Uh, we know that uh, the cursor of each incremental witness is a subpath of the uh, of the commitment tree. So, we can skip the entire calculation and then figure out how much we have to to trim from the commitment tree, and just copy the data we want. Um, the, the another advantage of that is that we uh, we preserve the um, the property of uh, memory usage. Uh, a number of blocks will be processed at a time, and once they are they are processed, uh, we can discard them. We we don't have um, any back and forth between blocks. We always scan forward, and once we are done with blocks, um, they can be removed from memory. And arguably, this is also true inside a, a Merkle tree, because once we are done with a layer. We could remove the, the data, the, the memory required for that layer. But at the end of the day, this doesn't really make any much difference because, uh, we have already allocated, uh, that much memory. So, for example, if the, if the bottom layer has, uh, 1000 nodes, we know that the next layer will only have uh, 500 nodes and the next layer will have two, 250 nodes. It, it divides by two every time, roughly. Um, but the, the idea here is that once we know that the uh, bottom layer has 1,000 nodes, we know that we're not going to need more memory because we can mostly work in place. Uh, so I, I guess that's the uh, another way to summarize it is that the implementation works in place. Uh, and finally, there are some uh, tweaks around the uh, Peterson hash. Uh, we, we can make it a little bit faster, but I think there could be even more room for improvements there. Um, so the uh, the result is that we have a way to update uh, the uh, the Merkle tree and, and commitment tree uh, incremental witnesses, and very importantly, we produce data. So we produce uh, serialization 
uh, of our CT and Adobe use that are exactly equal to the uh, deep Rust Zcash implementation. The, advent the major advantage of that is obviously we can easily um, verify that the implementation is correct by doing a bad compare, but also by having the same uh, serialization, we can directly inject this into um, the rest of the Libros Zcash. So for example, if we need to produce um, um, the uh, ZK Snark, uh, the ZK Snark will not take um, the IW directly, but it will take the Merkle path. And the Merkle path is calculated from the IW. Um, so we don't, our implementation actually does not know how to calculate the, um, the Merkle path because our data, data structure for IWU is just a bunch of, of, uh, of, of hashes. Uh, but what you can do is that as we store this uh, in, in the database as, um, as a byte stream, we can ask the, the reference implementation inside LibreOS Zcash to deserialize the same bytes. And then we leverage the reference implementation to compute the Merkle path. So that's that's kind of how the code stays small. Uh, all you know, the warp sync is not really big. It's, it's I think around three hundred and four hundred lines of code. Um, so how does uh, all this stay together? Uh, for the synchronization, so we we saw the, uh, the the main issue was uh, uh, ment uh, hash uh, maintenance, so uh, commitment tree uh, maintenance and incremental witness maintenance. But where do they fit inside the entire uh, synchronization uh, process? Um, so what we have is a, it's a very simple flow. Uh, so the data, data come, uh, and then it, it goes through channels. So this is a pipeline of different workers. And each worker has uh, bounded the capability, capacity. So, and again, the flow is, is uh, all forward. And with a flow like this, we basically know how much memory we need because the memory we need is just the sum of each uh, worker memory usage and, and the capacity of the channels. Actually, the, the channels are, are bound to one because there's no real need to have more than one. If we have, since it's a, it's a simple pipeline, if we have one stage of the uh, pipeline slower than the other, it would become the bottleneck. And, and, uh, even if we have bigger uh, capacity above this, the, the workers upstream of that bottleneck will eventually be um, blocked. So, uh, as we are processing thousands and thousands of blocks here, uh, we obviously cannot uh, buffer the entire blockchain. So there's no point in block in, in buffering, uh, more than one block at a time. Well, one more, one more than one chunk at a time. So one chunk is 10,000 blocks here. This value is, is very arbitrary. Um, so by doing that, we, we can see that the, the, we know the lifetime of each component. Uh, so as the, the data flows through the pipeline, at the end, the data is dropped. And because what we have extracted, um, which is basically uh, uh, the uh, incremental witness and uh, refer uh, receive nodes, uh, commitment tree, blah, blah, right? All these things are then stored in the database. So this is like taking a block, uh, stripping it apart, getting all the information we need and then throwing it away. Uh, another advantage of that is it's, uh, the, this, the flow is, is fairly streamlined and, uh, the data is, uh, is kept, uh, is, is kept in place. So when we have, uh, when we have, uh, of, um, visitors go through the data, the, the data is, is not copied. And uh, we we benefit from that by obviously with using data copy, but it also improves uh, uh, the memory access because uh, the data is already in cache and, and we don't have to reload and switch uh, switch around. So what are the uh, the workers in this uh, in this pipeline? The first element is the, uh, well, there's element zero, which is basically the, the one that is going to start feeding, uh, uh, chunks into the, uh, into the pipeline. So it's going to say, for example, that 
uh, you're staying synced at zero and you want to sync to one million. So it's going to cut that into chunks and then start pushing into the pipeline ranges of blocks. So we're talking the, the first element is actually a range of block. Then it gets to the downloader worker, which takes that range and queries uh, lib, um, not lib, light wallet D uh, to get a range of blocks. Then that range of blocks is going to be uh, trio decrypted. And so the advantage here is that decryption can be paralyzed, uh, paralyzed, sorry. So uh, we can use um, parallel iterator, which is provided by Rayon, and, and it will process uh, nodes in, uh, at the same time. So before we have concurrency here, we start to have uh, par parallelism. So we're going to use more than one CPU for this stage. And then after that stage, after not trying the decryption, the, the blocks will have uh, the initial data plus all the nodes that we were able to identify and they belong to us. Okay. The next part is uh, to do the, um, the Merkle tree and uh, incremental witness um, uh, updates. So that's what we describe as warp sync. And one thing that we also can uh, parallelize in that stage is the uh, calculation of the hashes. So we have, um, when we go from one layer to, uh, to the next, we, we have to combine nodes two by two. And this uh, com combination is independent from pairs. So we can spawn, uh, spawn several uh, workers Again, it's managed by Rayon. So Rayon will take care of having the, the uh, appropriate number of workers and to leverage the, the number of uh, CPU cores that you have. Um, so this is basically the same as uh, the state before, the stage before. Uh, again, this is a uh, parallel iteration. Uh, so then next stage then therefore is the uh, commitment tree and uh, incremental witness computations. And finally, we have all the information we need, and we can push this into uh, the, the database, into the storage, so into SQL Lite. Uh, that's for the um, the shielded as aspects of the blockchain of the of the wallet. But if you do have uh, transactions that uh, you want to fully uh, analyze, because and this is optional, this is also something that you can turn off. Um, if you are satisfied with having just the uh, amount of, of um, object that you have received or sent, uh, but you don't need to know uh, the memo uh, content or you don't need to know where, where it was sent to, uh, you can stop there. Uh, if not, if you want to have more details, um, we have a stage where the, uh, each transaction that you, you have done uh, will be queried in uh, create to um, like wallet D. And here we also do it concurrently. So the issue here is that unfortunately, the API is a uh, is, uh, single single query at a time. So you, you have to pass the transaction hash uh, into one RPC, one call, and it would return the, um, the, the full transaction data. But you can't, you can't send a bunch, you, can, you can't send a list, and you can't stream a list. Um, so actually you would pay the, the, the cost of the latency between uh, your wallet and the server every uh, every transaction you have. And if you have a large number of transactions, the, the cost adds up very quickly. So in order to mitigate this problem, uh, we do concurrent download. So we, we, we send a bunch of uh, up to eight uh, transaction requests at the same uh, one time. And when we start receiving results, uh, we do the decoding and the storing interleaved with further further downloads. Uh, this is really uh, efficient. It works. It works out very well um, because at the end of the day, uh, before this was implemented, the the cost of getting transaction details could be higher actually than than uh, than, than the rest uh, of the process. And, and now it's uh it's, it's rather minimal, and this was all due to latency. Um, so all in, all in all, I think uh, you may recognize some uh, design patterns of uh, high-frequency trading. 
this is uh, is something that is is fairly common in in this kind of uh, applications. Uh, typically, the uh, the the need to have optimized network um, uh, the optimized network uh, access pattern we uh, uh, to uh, to reduce latency. It's it's very important in HFT. Uh, HFT is high frequency. Yeah, it's high frequency trading. So you, you want your orders to reach the market as soon as possible, um, and and uh, the rest is also very similar. So having a pipeline, having uh, workers, and having uh, parallelism, but in, inside workers, it's a very standard pattern. Um, Okay, so this is, I think, the rest we are uh, we discussed during the call. So this this concludes the um, the overview of the uh, technical aspects of uh, Z Wallet.